Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's wonderful lecture from one of our uh, one of our fantastic uh, U.S. Capitol Historical Society Capitol Fellows. My name is Samuel Holliday, and I have the great pleasure of serving as Director of Operations and Scholarship for the U.S. Capitol Historical Society. And we're grateful that so many of you have taken time out of your day to hear about this fascinating chapter in Capitol history. Before we get into today's presentation, I'd like to go over just a couple of technical housekeeping matters. While we're still limited in how we can engage with you, our fantastic audience of supporters and members, uh, we love using this Zoom platform to provide some of the public history programming and community uh, that we're so fond of. One of the ways this works is if you have any uh, content-based questions for our fellow Blake Lindsay uh, during the course of today's program, you can put those content-based questions into the Q&A section of the webinar. That looks like either two that looks like two speech bubbles, either at the top or bottom of your screen, depending on what kind of device you're using to join us today. Now, if at any point in today's program you have some technical difficulties and you need some troubleshooting, you can put those comments into the chat section of the webinar, which I'll be keeping an eye on in real time and responding to in real time. So once again, any content questions for Mr. Lindsay can go into the Q&A section. Any technical troubleshooting can go into the chat section. It's now also my great pleasure to introduce the president and CEO of the U.S. Capitol Historical Society to start our program today, Jane Campbell. Jane. Hi, Sam. Uh, thank you again for all the work you do to bring these programs to our guests, our visitors. Um, we are really honored to have you as part of the team. So today, my friends, we have one of our Capitol, uh, Capitol fellows. And the, just quickly, uh, the United States Capitol Historical Society has a partnership with the Architect of the Capitol's Curator's Office uh, to bring fellows who are interested particularly in the art and architecture and the stories of the Capitol itself. Um, and we bring these scholars to do research with the Architect of the Capitol, um, and they help us by creating stories telling, telling and uh, strengthening the understanding. Of course, during the pandemic, we, it's been a little more limited than it has in the past, but we have one uh, of our fellows who's been able to be with us. Um, and Blake Lindsay is that fellow who is our guest today. Blake Lindsay is a local historian and author whose work has been featured in Washington History and the Midwest Quarterly. His research into the Civil War defenses of Washington earned grants and accolades from Virginia Tech and Pittsburgh State University and influenced recent programming with the National Park Service. Blake uh, earned our Capitol Fellow uh, designee in June of 2020 to pursue research into history of tourism at the Capitol which is a passion that has been awakened by his own experience providing interpretation of the building to the public as a visitor guide at the United States Capitol Visitor Center. Blake holds degrees in history from Pittsburgh State University and Clemson University. And so it is my honor now to present to you our scholar for the day, Blake Lindsay. Thank you so much. Sam and Jane, thank you everyone for coming today. Um, and while I get this on screen. So obviously when, and, and thank you so much for the Capital Historical Society for supporting this research. It's, it's been very motivating having someone like them uh, behind it, uh, obviously in the context of our times. And speaking of that context, you know, I was talking with Sam and Jane before um, when I first reached out to them about the fellowship all the way back in January of 2020, you know, studying the history of capital tourism took on a completely different focus and scope uh, than it does now. Uh, needless to say, uh, it's evolved into something quite different. It's turned into a deep, personal, very personal, and at times, frankly, painful journey of discovery until just what the last two years has been. In the context of the whole, how do we how do we move forward? You know, when we do come back, how do we be there for visitors while at the same time respecting the last two years of our collective experience? And there are so many takeaways from this. I, I and I think just a few of them are just the centrality of tourism and visitation at the Capitol. I'll use these terms interchangeably, uh, and shaping the building's meaning, and shaping it even its very existence. 
it's such a ubiquitous part of the building's history that we it's easy to just not stop and take notice of what happened, what it says about us. And uh, I, I kind of want to start and set this tone by uh, telling you kind of a case in point real quickly. I want to take you to the day, February 12, 1865. Now, on that day, the man in the middle of your screen, Reverend Henry Highland Garnett, spoke on the floor of the House of Representatives uh, at their invitation, the first Black American to do so in either the House or the Senate. Now, by itself, that's a monumentous historic occasion, and the content of his speech, important as it was, isn't really what I want to focus on here. It's actually his surroundings that day. Who came to see him? Right? If you looked in the galleries that day, it wouldn't have just been your standard capital visitor at the time, relative wealthy, well-connected, politically oriented, had the time to, to do so. Uh, no, it was black men, women, and children who packed the galleries, packed the corridors around the chamber, the rotunda, and all the spaces itself. And this was widely commented on, because as you can see in the Portland Daily Press in the upper left of your screen, um, prior to this, Congress's own rules governing day-to-day -day visitor operations explicitly prohibited free Black Americans from even entering the building or the grounds. They could only be there as enslaved servants to white visitors, right? Which, you know, talk about the irony of that, going into the Temple of Liberty as a visitor, but you have no liberty at all. But of course, this moment on February 12th, 1865, completely broke this wide open. And people widely commented on it. And I, if you were going to ask me to sort of arbitrarily rank some of the most important moments in the history of the Capitol building. I think this would absolutely be one of them because it, it illustrates so well kind of the best of capital tourism, what it says about us, right? This inaugurated a free Black experience at the Capitol, sort of entry into civic society. Uh, and then as now, visiting the Capitol is a personal opportunity for visitors from the, all over the country and the world to engage in sort of our collective civic mission to guarantee liberty and justice for all. In short, I think the people who went to the Capitol at the, that day showed us what the Capitol's role is in defining what it means to be an American. And I don't think I'm alone in this interpretation. If you look on the lower left of your screen, that painting by Alan Cox in the Cox Corridors, the first floor of the house wing, that, that man in the gray suit, that's supposed to be Henry Highland Garnett. So Alan Cox sort of nodded to this moment uh, when he painted on the wall. And I sort of want to come at this idea about the, the importance of tourism in the building's history in a slightly different way today. Because the story I'm going to tell you is about the creation of the U.S. Capitol Guide Service in 1876 and its really bizarre aftermath in the 10 years following that. And if you're looking for sort of a life altering or inspiring story, I'm afraid you're not going to find that here. This is something a little bit grindier. It's a story firmly rooted in the, the times in which it took place. I know I'm a little late to this party because uh, the Capital Historical Society had a symposium on um, the Gilded Age some months ago. And this is a story that absolutely is a good way to understand these times. Um, but it involves normal everyday people that were wrapped up in accusations of corruptions, surprising amounts of intrigue, and I think legitimate questions about what the Capitol means in our society. Right? And most of these people you're going to see to hear about today, there's photographs of them. They only appear sort of briefly in the historical record before sort of disappearing into the mists of time. Um, but I think the story has some things to teach us. So it's a long story. There's a lot to tell. So let's dive into it. So I want to start with the year 1876. One of the most important years, I think, in our nation's history for a lot of reasons. Uh, it was a pivotal election year. Everyone knew it. Everything that Henry Highland Garnett was speaking about was absolutely at stake. Um, that this was also a time of shocking technological innovation. This was around the time that the, the light bulb, uh, the telephone were coming on the scene, railroads transforming American life. Uh, and it was also, of course, the 100th birthday uh, of the United States, the 100th anniversary when Congress declared the war that all men are created equal. Uh, so let's go kind of go back and see what the rotunda looked like at the time, according to the Illustrated London News. And you can see it's this very vibrant scene. It's very busy. Not just lots of people, but lots of different types of people. There's a wonderful uh, account from a student, college student who visited uh, the Capitol around this time. And he wrote back to his college newsletter saying that here at the Capitol, I can see, quote, the throbbing life of the nation. And I think this picture really sums this up very well. Um, and the thing about the centennial is it led to this sort of outpouring of patriotic feeling and a desire to kind of come closer to what America was all about. And I, I think it's important 
to keep in mind that for a lot of the visitors at this time, a lot of the people in this photograph, the idea of celebrating a 100th birthday of America probably a decade before seemed not only doubt, but very much in doubt, right, as the country was coming out of the Civil War. Uh, and so people came to the Capitol in huge numbers, unlike what they had before, uh, because where better to celebrate this moment than at the kind of the center of it all, uh, the sort of spiritual heart of our uh, civic religion. But uh, this wasn't, of course, the first time people came to the Capitol. Whenever you kind of see this subject written about, uh, this is sort of 1876 is the date that people often sort of point to it, where it really begins. And on some level, I think that makes sense. But I think it's worth setting up some context for this, right? Because this had a long history. Let's go back to when the building looked like this. Before the Capitol was even finished being constructed. Uh, from the moment it opened its doors as just a tiny little sliver of what it would become in 1800, uh, it was always open to the public. It was in fact designed uh, to be a public space. It came with visitor galleries in the House and Senate. Uh, people could roam its halls. And in fact, uh, the Capitol architect at this time, Benjamin Latrobe, uh, he wrote to Congress in 1807 complaining about how visitors had, quote, free reign throughout the building. For him, this was an annoyance that got in the way of completed construction. And when you read his words, you can kind of see Latrobe's more kind of aristocratic bearing. Uh, he asked this question about who, quote, ought and ought not to be there. I underlined it in this text because he actually emphasized it in writing. And uh, so he's asking questions that so there should be some kind of control about this. This is unique. And he begrudgingly understood the need for public access. But you can tell that he thinks that there should be more thought being given to this. And his predecessor as architect, Charles Bullfinch, would actually echo these sentiments, albeit in a bit more kind of politic way. Uh, Bullfinch wrote to Congress in 1820, saying that, hey, you need to appoint guards, not just to protect yourselves and protect the space, but to protect all these visitors. There are hundreds of people coming here in over a course of several months, right? But he went even further than that. He said that you need to appoint guides to help people understand what they're seeing. In a democratic republic, not only is public access to these government spaces important, but, you know, if you've been to the Capitol, you'll, you'll get this. There's lots of intimidating architecture and art, lot, lots of sort of symbolism being thrown at you. And in Bullfinch's mind, there needed to be specialized guides to help people interpret this, to let them know what they're seeing, right? So they don't feel left out, right? Now, it took a while, but Congress did listen to Bullfinch's and Latrobe's uh, recommendations. In 1828, they created United States Capitol Police, which, of course, as a police force, that satisfied the guard component of what Bullfinch was asking for. But it also actually uh, fulfilled the guide component as well, because one of their explicit duties as prescribed by Congress was to, quote, conduct visitors through the building. And unless you think that these were just guys that kind of stood around, answered questions here and there, uh, you actually might be surprised to learn that these were people who would absolutely be recognized as interpreters and tour guides the way we would recognize this trip today. Uh, their first chief, David Wilson, in fact, was widely celebrated as the subject matter expert on the building. He did his own research into the records surrounding the creation of the art. He talked to artists themselves to find things to uh, tell to visitors. And Wilson and his staff were celebrated as, quote, the great Cicerones of the Capitol. Cicerone being a really old fancy word for basically a tour guide, right? So when we go back to 1876, we see that this tradition, it has a long history. And there's people that are there to be Congress as sort of face of the world, Capitol Police. But the centennial was something completely different. Whereas you might get a few hundred visitors a day before on a busy time. Now you're seeing several thousands a day, every day throughout the centennial year. And this, this would still pale in in comparison to numbers even 50 or 100 years later, right? But still, it was a lot. And by this point, the Capitol Police, they're led by a man named Captain Samuel Blackford, who's going to play an important part in the story. He was a war veteran from Ohio uh, in the recent rebellion. And you can actually see on the left what the uniform for Capitol Police looked like at this time. Pretty interesting, right? It's like a marching band or something almost. Uh, but this is not a picture of Samuel Blackford. I'm pretty sure of that. And the reason I'm pretty sure is because uh, Blackford actually lost an arm fighting in the rebellion uh, in 1864 uh, at a battle at Hatches Run, Virginia. The Civil War bus might know where that is. But he and his staff, 
are doing the best they can, but they were kind of set up for failure. For reasons, um, I'll spare you the reasons for now, so it's a long story. Uh, the reputation of Capitol Police had suffered through the Civil War and Reconstruction Era, to the point that members of Congress, including Senator Charles Sumner, were actively calling for its outright abolition in the late 1860s. Now, Congress, they never went quite so far as to just do away with Capitol Police, but just the year before the centennial, 1875, they cut the staff by half, right? Um, and exact numbers are kind of hard to find, but this meant there were probably only about a dozen officers to not only patrol the grounds, but to provide some kind of experience for visitors. Uh, and this was a building 750 feet long, three plus stories high, not to mention the 56 acres of grounds around the building that were also their responsibility. So they had a hard time of it, but they did have some help. Over the years, uh, locals recognized the possibilities of catering to these visitors, not only at the Capitol, but throughout the city. And um, the origins of what we would call sort of the local city guide business emerged. Uh, these were locals who would just patrol up and down Pennsylvania Avenue, hang out in the hotels, uh, and engage with travelers. You know, say, hey, would you like a guide to see the buildings? I can show you around, right? And that's a great service. So you would think with Capitol Police's struggles in terms of staffing, the sudden surge in visitation, that these local guides would be quite a benefit. And sure, some were, but we can kind of see how that works out here. Because the sort of ugly truth of the matter was is that a very dangerous atmosphere prevailed over the Capitol during the centennial year. People would pose as guides to lure tourists into dark alleys and isolated places and sort of mug them, rob them. Uh, people would hang around the grounds, pose as government officials and charge an admission fee to get in the building, which is a ridiculous. You've never had to pay to get in, right? Uh, and uh, the ditz crowds of the rotunda offered opportunities for pickpockets to weave in and out and take cash, jewelry, purses, wallets, whatever. Uh, vandalism became a problem. So it wasn't just visitors that needed protecting, it was the building that needed protecting from visitors. Uh, they, people looking for souvenirs would take, they would uh, tear away pieces of curtain, chip away pieces of furniture in marble and sandstone in the statuary, right? So there, there's a lot of things going on that Capitol Police frankly just can't deal with. They don't have the numbers to deal with it. And I think it's worth building some context here too, because this wasn't just you know bad people doing bad things. Um, the late 19th century in America, if you went to any of the uh, Gilded Age symposiums that the Historical Society put on some time ago, you can find them on their website, by the way, they're great. Uh, this era in American history is known for a lot of things, but one of them are these absolutely vicious boom and bust financial cycles that could see your life savings basically evaporate overnight. And this is way before the FDIC, Social Security, there was really no safety net. And in 1876, the country was on the back end of the worst depression in its history up to that point. But on top of that, DC actually received a double gut punch. Earlier in the decade, Congress and the city had recognized tourism and its growing uh, opportunities, and they embarked on an ambitious program to modernize the city, to pave its streets, to install monitor amenities like plumbing and gas street lights, to line the avenues with trees, Right, to make it a truly world capital, a place that you'd want to go. Right? But mismanagement of these projects combined with the Depression causing Congress to just obliterate these contracts basically overnight. That meant that hundreds of working class DC families, uh, many of them Black, Irish, many of them recent veterans of war, uh, who depended on day laborers' wages to survive, they had nothing. And so what happened was is that the centennial travel uh, offered opportunities to just try and scrape by. And you read these kind of heartbreaking accounts of visitors complaining about being constantly bombarded by people, especially kids and teenagers, begging to offer their services as guides to the Capitol and other places. And I, I, there's sort of a twisted poetry in this, I think, um, because underneath the optimism and hope of the centennial, there was sort of this much darker underbelly that hid just beneath the surface that visitors really couldn't look away from. But for Capitol Police, obviously, this is a problem. They don't have the time or the ability to change American society. They have to deal with this. And Congress was not oblivious to this atmosphere either. In fact, uh, they told the sergeant at arms, 
that summer, hey, you need to do something. And the sergeant at arms, of course, then went to Capitol Police and said, hey, you need to do something. And Blackford, bless his heart, was doing the best he could with what he had. Uh, he posted uh, announced regular announcements in the papers, begging visitors to, to be careful. You can actually read one of them at the top of that National Republican art, uh, article called Rogues at the Capitol, where he said, well, you just watch out. You don't know who these people are. Come to us. We'll do our best. And he was even trying to apprehend some of these people. Um, for example, he was uh, trying to apprehend a pickpocket in the rotunda one day, and he had his good arm broken, actually. So this man is literally putting his body on the line, left unarmed uh, to deal with this. But uh, he's got to do something. And, but he's not give, being given anything to do anything with. doesn't have any kind of appropriations to hire more police. So he does maybe the only thing he could do. He adopts the idea, if you can't beat him, then I'll join him. He finds the guys that he knows are reputable, anyone he could trust, and designates them as officially licensed Capitol tour guides, accountable to Capitol Police and hired by Capitol Police, or essentially an extension of them. But these are guides, specialized, specialized just as tour guides, freeing up the police to do what they need to do as police, right? And he makes this announcement in September of 1876. And this is really kind of the birth of the U.S. Capitol Guide Service. You can see this patch on the right that used to be worn some time ago uh, by them. And it says 1876 on it for this reason. And kind of a funny story, but uh, there's a plaque that exists. It was given to the Guide Service by Congress some time ago. I don't know when. And it says their birthday was July 4th, 1876, uh, which was an arbitrary, arbitrary date chosen as patriotic, sure. But uh, of course, they're normal and no one has looked this deeply uh, into this, I think, as me. So I think that birthday really is more like September. And by October, these guides are on the floor uh, providing tours. And now this is an elegant solution, but it doesn't really address the main problem. How do you deal with all these more unscrupulous people hanging around victimizing tourists. Uh, in November, Blackford makes uh, a rather stunning and radical move. He issues an order calling for the arrest of all peoples offering themselves as guides of the Capitol for compensation. Now up to the Capitol Police and the Guide Service. He essentially created a monopoly, an exclusive right of the Guide Service to provide tours. In fact, city guides were not even allowed in the building with their visits. They were just sort of taken in and handed back off. Uh, and this new system, uh, this would be the way it would be for the next almost 100 years of capital history. And then let's take a moment to sort of see what this system looked like. Uh, you can see here, this is an 1881 illustration a quote, an official guide conducting a party of ladies through the capital. I mentioned how a lot of these guides were young, teenagers, kids. You, you see that here uh, with this young guy with the cane. In fact, uh, of the first sort of guides appointed, from this era, most of the ones I've been able to actually identify by name, they were teenagers, 17, 18, 19 years old, young people. Um, and the way the system worked is that these guides would sort of patrol the floor, usually the rotunda. The rotunda was kind of their home base. And they would uh, engage with visitors. Maybe they see a group looking at uh, the baptism of Pocahontas. They approach, hey, I see you're looking at this painting. I'd be glad to tell you about it and so many more wonderful things for a small fee. 25 cents a person was the minimum. So this was the biggest change, maybe, because prior to this, the Capitol Police gave tours for free. They were being given government salaries, part of the civic service. But remember, Blackford was given no appropriations to do anything with. He had to allow them to uh, charge for tours just to make sure they got paid and make sure he had staff. Right. And in time, the U.S. members of the U.S. Guide Service would take on this sort of weird cultural uh, status almost like they were uh, you know, pop culture icons in a weird way. They were, because they spoke to so many different kinds of people from all over the world and the country, they were kind of imbued with this sort of folk wisdom. And the cartoons you're seeing is just a, a small sample of just the kind of attention they got. Uh, they were the subjects of poetry, of stage plays, uh, et cetera. And this, is, this especially came true about 1890. And if you saw my Capital Conversations from some weeks ago, I really went into detail about this phenomenon and what it said about the Capitol's role in American culture at the time. But it took uh, some controversy to get to this point, because the first 10 years or so of the Guide Service existence were anything but glamorous. 
And because uh, the thing was, at the time, 1876, people generally agreed with Blackford's move, thought it was necessary to protect visitors and to protect this, this, not just the building's reputation, but the city as well. But the thing is, Blackford and his colleagues knew that the 1876 surge in visitation was not an aberration, that as railways expanded, as leisure travel became more part of American culture, that this was, that was actually the future, right? They got a peek of what this was going to be like every day. So he made the guide service permanent. He also made those prohibitions for city guides coming into the building permanent. And, and beginning in early 1877, people started to be arrested for unauthorized tour guiding at the Capitol, which is just a hilarious thing to think about. This was a minor crime. It, was a, it just went to the local police courts. But when these arrests started happening, people started, kind of started to raise eyebrows because this raises some questions, doesn't it? Like, isn't this the people's house? How, how can you say other people cannot be even come in to provide tours. How do you even define that? If I'm just a local who lives here, people come from out of town, I take them and then start talking to them about the art of the capital. Am I getting an unauthorized tour? So it, it seemed, this seemed to be against the spirit of the place. And you see the judge uh, in the po local police court basically saying as much, saying, you know, a lot of these guys are perfectly reputable. They're not drunken, disorderly. They're being arrested simply for asking if visitors want a guide to tour the capital, right? And he went on to say there should be no monopoly in this matter, right? So public opinion started to swing against this move in 77, 78, 79. However, the more unscrupulous elements of the local guide scene never went away. In fact, they just adapted, they got worse. And they started to come up with these really elaborate, bizarre schemes to squeeze money out of tourists in ways that seem almost unbelievable today. And, and the most infamous example of this were the Monty Men, the three card Monty Men of Washington, D.C. The way this sort of scheme worked is City Guide, one of these sort of more criminal guides, I guess I'll call them. They would be in a hotel or on Pennsylvania Avenue around town. It size up somebody, usually a, a single male college student. Hey, do you want a tour? Sure, I'll show you around the city. OK, well, I'll take you to the Capitol, but it's actually closed right now. But instead, there's a new statue of Robert E. Lee at Arlington National Cemetery. You've got to see it. And then we'll go to the Capitol later. And this is interesting because you start to see this is when Robert E. Lee starts to take on kind of a new cultural meeting himself. Before, he was kind of a somewhat reviled figure, but now he's becoming a sort of a cultural icon. Anyway, so they would take them to the Potomac River, start rowing across to get to Arlington. And the guide would ask the unsuspecting visitor, uh, hey, are you armed? There are poisonous snakes around here. We might need to deal with this. What he's really asking is, hey, is this person going to come after me if I rob them? So anyway, they get across, but they say, hey, we're not going to go see the Statue of Lee just yet. Wait until it's sunset. The sun is going to hit it just right. It's perfect. In the meantime, why don't we kill some time at this tavern around the corner? And they would go get them drunk, ply them with liquor, and engage them in rigged card games, like three card Monty. And there was even some strong evidence that local Alexandria police were in on this and taking a cut of all of this. And it, it seems almost unbelievable today, but the Washington Post uh, made a point. It was like, you know, it's always the, the visitors always seem to fall for this, right? So naturally, this caused public opinion to swing back the other way. That, you know what, we may not like the fact that tours are now a chart paid experience, that um, there's all these exclusions, but maybe this is just how it needs to be. To protect the reputation of the city and the building. And the city tried to intervene in this too. Uh, they experimented with using Blackford's system with city guides. They would uh, only license those that were reputable that they knew about, and you couldn't give tours of the city without a license. And when this failed and this didn't work, they did away with these restrictions. And if you're, if you're a city guide or familiar with the industry, you'll know that Washington, D.C. has been going back and forth on this for years, literally ever since the early 1880s, starting with this controversy, uh, has DC gone to regulations where guides need to be uh, licensed versus not? So anyway, as you can imagine, when you have a bunch of young men uh, in this age in which uh, casual violence between men is sort of welcome, especially as part of working class culture, that a very healthy marinated beef emerged between the city guides in the members of the U.S. Capitol Guide Service. And one of the frustrating things of studying all this is how the press at the time would 
use capital with an O, as in the building, and capital with an A, as in the city, interchangeably. Meaning that they would talk about a capital guy with an O getting arrested and how this was a setback for their side of this whole debate, which led to some really hilarious retractions, such as this one you see now in February 1882, in which they said, quote, the capital guides and capital guides are a different class of people altogether. The former being authorized guides by law and operate in the capital only, while the latter are alleged to be a set of tricksters and sharpers. So in this war of words, you can see there's really no punches held on this. Uh, and it should perhaps also not be surprising that this war of words would spill into the streets of D.C. itself. Like I said, these are young men in the Gilded Age. Casual violence was just sort of part of things, unfortunately, as we're going to see. And alcohol probably had no small part to play in this. Now, Capitol Police like to say, oh, we only appoint guides that are sober and industrious, right? But eh, I have my reason to doubt that. I mean, there's a reason, folks, that people like Francis Willer at the same time are crusading against alcohol's role in our society. People were drunk and fighting all the time. But I'm going to tell you a story that really illustrates this, uh, as well as kind of point to how visitors are really the ones being caught in the middle of all of this, really. Um, let's go to August 1883. A city guide by the name of William Brown has visitors in tow. He's walking up the east steps of the Capitol towards the Columbus doors to go into the rotunda when he stopped by a member of the guide service, Benjamin Cady, who would have been in his early 20s at this point, and, and tells the visitors, hey, we're, we're happy to show you around, but your guide needs to stay out here. This, of course, leads to an argument between Brown and Cady, which they're rehashing everything I've been talking about. And you gotta think, to the visitors, what are they gonna do? They're just watching this being like, uh, uh, Never mind, it's just not worth it. And that's actually what they do, is they say, hey, we'll come back on our own, but we already paid this guy, let's go to somewhere else. So they walk away. Let's fast forward to three weeks later. Benjamin Cady, getting off work. He lives at 118 7th Street Northeast, just a few blocks from uh, Sam and Jane, actually, at the Historical Society headquarters. But he doesn't make it home that night. First, he stops at the corner of First Street West and Pennsylvania Avenue, which is the site of this still fairly new monument called Peace Monument, a memorial dedicated by Congress to those lost during the Civil War. And he's here, um, why did he go there? Maybe he was catching a streetcar, maybe he was meeting friends for a happy hour after uh, work to, on, you know, to a tavern on Penn Avenue. But this Peace Monument was also where city guides were known to kind of gather to find business. Well, he's standing here when three men approach him. The city guide, William Brown, from a few weeks before, his brother, James Brown, and another accomplice named Arthur Harris. They start arguing. Uh, Katie, armed with a cane, this was sort of standard issue for guides at the time. Uh, well, he's outnumbered, but has an ability to defend himself. So he's sitting like a tour guide samurai, trying to sort of back them off, but they overwhelm him. They knock him to the ground. Just overhead, you can actually see Peace Monument the allegorical figure of Greek crying on the shoulders of history as they just beat the tar out of this poor man. And he was badly wounded. He broke several ribs, badly bruised, but when bystanders intervened, the three men scattered. Well, Katie and police, they know these guys, so they're quickly apprehended and tried for assault and battery. At their trial, they don't deny beating up Ben Katie. They just deny the, that really that they didn't have a right to do so. He wouldn't let them in the building, and they sort of claim that he struck first with his cane, which who knows? But they are found guilty and they're charged and they're fined five dollars for the incident. And now if you're worried about being Katie, he would be out of work for a while, but he would bounce back. In fact, we've seen him once before. There he is right there. Uh, that picture in the middle, that gentleman with the whiskers, that's Ben Katie, as pictured in 1920. Uh, he was one of the first of these guides to be appointed to the guide service in either late 76 or early 77. And uh, he would go on to be a tour guide for 50 years over 50 years, uh, when he died suddenly and tragically from an accident in 1929, uh, he would be widely eulogized as, quote, the father of the U.S. guide service. But lest you think that this war, this, con this general era or aura of conflict is just between the city guides and the guide service, think again, visitors got in on this too, believe it or not. And the guides, members of the guide service also turn on each other, as we will see. Now, one of the, aside from Katie, another sort of early figure, in the guide services history was many of George McCauley. 
who, like Katie, was relatively young from Maryland, grew up in the region. Uh, Macaulay made a name for himself in 1879 for uh, helping save the life of capital artist Constantino Brunetti, uh, the famous Italian painter who did so much to beautify the, the building. And the story went, and, and uh, he was painting the frieze about 80 feet above the rotunda floor when he suffers an accident. Doesn't fall, thank goodness, but he's elderly, he's exhausted, and he's panicked. So Macaulay, uh, he seizes from the rotunda floor, rushes up the stairs, and assists Capitol Police in saving his life. And by the way, there's a, an excellent article in the Capitol Historic Society Journal, Dome, about Vermitti's accident. I don't know, Sam, if you want to put a link to that or the chat, or go check out their website. They have a lot of great articles about this and other kind of things. So Macaulay, let's fast forward to a couple years later, in 1882. It's a busy day in March. Uh, departs from a group, sits down in the rotunda next to his fellow guide and, uh, and also next door neighbor, James K. Wood. And he says something to the effect of, man, James, it's been a hell of a day. Which, by the way, I've never used four-letter words like that to describe a busy day at work. But visitor overhears this language and takes offense to it, confronts Macaulay about it. Macaulay can't help himself. He does not back down. The visitor escalates by grabbing him by the lapels. Macaulay, quote, knocked his hand down, and I told him if he did it again, I would knock him down. The visitor then asked for the, uh, his badge number. Macaulay told him it was number two and that my name was George Macaulay and that his name has never been disgraced. Of course, he wrote this to the chief of Capitol Police, quote, trusting you will see this in the proper light. and He didn't get in trouble, which is just outstanding, right? But guides also turn on each other, like I mentioned. Uh, what you see now is an image of the rotunda about in 1928. Would have looked kind of similar uh, that it did in the 1880s. You see the benches that are there now weren't there, just chairs around the room. And this is where the guides would sit in between tours, take a break, and just kind of scan the room, right? Well, going through the records of the architect of the Capitol's curator office, which Jane mentioned before, I, I found this note attached to a series of letters just said the Lee Brown affair. It was the only, now the uh, Capital Guide Service correspondence files, it's a folder about an inch and a half thick like this, but this was, this was the only one that had a label that someone made, gosh knows how long ago. What, what was this? Well, this is something that happened in October, 1885 between uh, members of the Guide Service named Buford Lee and Arthur Brown. The way this, what happened was, is Lee, he sees a group coming out of the north side of the building into the rotunda. He goes to engage with them, offer them a tour. Around the same time, Brown shoves him out of the way, says, I saw them first, they're my group. And the two men start arguing loudly. They're pacing around the rotunda, screaming at each other from across the room. It's right in front of visitors, by the way, who again are just kind of like, uh. Um, now, this was not the first time Lee had been sort of, uh, Lee had this kind of conflict with another guy. In fact, earlier in the year, in February, Buford Lee was coming into the rotunda from the west stairs. They were coming out of the Congressional Library. And uh, he's with a group, and this group sees some of their friends that they had been separated from. And they greet, and Lee offers them a tour. Hey, why don't you join us? 25 cents, we'll show you some great things. We'll have a good time. Well, at that same moment, none other than our old friend George Macaulay butts in, says you're monopolizing the business, right? And that causes Lee and Macaulay to start arguing, again, right in front of these visitors. Just wild stuff. And um, so what do they have against Lee? Okay, well, Lee has faced this kind of behavior also from visitors. In 1884, he pulled a knife on a visitor. But in his own defense, quote, when a man walks up and strikes me, have I not the right to defend myself, with, whether with a knife, pistol, or a club in self-defense? Okay, well, point taken. And it can't just be that. He has a violent temperament, which he's George Macaulay. He was no angel. So no, there's something else that's causing people to react this way to Buford Lee. Now, when you look at the records, it's not actually hard to see why. I will let George McCauley and Arthur Brown explain themselves. Now, I'm not gonna say the words, but I'm not gonna spare you from them either. As the first and only black member of the US Capitol Guide Service, he was always gonna face challenges, especially at a time like the Gilded Age, absolutely steeped and racial hatred, and when white supremacy would basically took on the form of national policy. You can see this uh, in Arthur Brown's words at the bottom in that letter from October 1885. And, but when 
members of the guide service and police formed a cabal against Lee. They made his life absolute hell. And Lee wrote these desperate letters to the architect of the Capitol, Edward Clark, at the time, who's overseeing all of this. He's even above Capitol Police. And Lee begs him, he says, what must I do? Remain in the rotunda and see a party before any other guide? Then one of the guides comes up and says that that's his party, and I have to get out of his way. If not, I'm reported to the captain of police and suspended just for doing my duty and making a living as a guide. If I did not stand up for my rights in the rotunda, I would not make or earn 25 cents a day. You can hear the desperation in his voice. Uh, and so Clark, he, he takes notice and he calls for an investigation. He brings in one of his friends, a house librarian, to oversee this, get statements. And Arthur Brown's statement um, basically reads like a kid with puppy dog eyes, who knows he's been caught doing something he shouldn't, but says, I'm a good Christian man, whatever. And the result of the investigation is that uh, both men are given reprimands, both Brown and Lee, for acting the way they did. But in uh, sort of establishing the status quo, this doomed Buford Lee, and he disappears from the record after this. Uh, in fact, I can't even find any census records yet uh, of him after 1870. And um, by the time in the 1890s, when the guide service becomes kind of this literary subject, Lee is nowhere to be found in, in, in any of those mentions. And I think this is a story that kind of brings us full circle in a way, um, because we see how people recognized the high stakes involved in capital tourism, right? And there's in visitor safety, and, uh, and also just the financial rewards of re of catering to this business. And it would be many years later that there would be finally reforms and visitors didn't have to pay anymore, right? Um, but I kind of bring up this sort of idea of high stakes because, uh, you know, I really want to hope and kind of here's to hoping and praying that as we move forward, whenever that is, whatever that looks like, that Congress, Capitol Police, and all of us who have a role to play in this, that we, we give this wonderful tradition the respect and the care that it deserves, right? Because, uh, you know, I think I've shown you today just a taste of the kinds of things that can happen when it doesn't get that care and respect, right? So thank you all again for coming. Again, thank you to the Historical Society. Uh, Jane, Sam, I'll, I'll pass it back to you and happy to answer any questions. Lake, thank you so much. You really sort of gave us a historical perspective, um, you know, as we're coming here on our 250th anniversary uh, <clears throat> as a country, you, you talk about what did we do on our 100th anniversary um, as we look at the Capitol itself. We've got a couple of questions um, that we want to share with you from our, our visitor, our, our audience. <coughs> First, I want to tell you that several people have written and said, what a great presentation. We're so delighted to hear from you. So Thank you, that is encouraging. Um, now, one of the people asked if you could uh, go back and tell us, when you look at these historical pictures, where in the Capitol are people located? Can you yeah. flip through that and tell that story? Sure, let's find some. So the one on the left, um, that it looks like they're at the surrender of General Burgoyne in the rotunda. And the way I kind of <laughs> determine that is if you look at the painting to the left, that looks like declaration. And if you actually, what really uh, tipped me off was the bas relief on the very upper left, that looks to me like Daniel Boone. Uh, that relief, if you're familiar with it. Mm -hmm. And let's go back now. So this photograph, well, I got to go back a ways. This photograph that I find interesting, because yeah, where is that? Is, uh, is a question that I ask. It, this looks like it's somewhere in the corridors, maybe in the expansion spaces. And I wonder what all those pictures were. Um, just for context, you know, tour routes all obviously work very different. And then they, there was no prescribed tour route. And like the Bermuda corridors and um, for example, like even the third floor of the Senate wing where like the vice president could be found, even the president can be found. Those, these were fair game. And also at the time, uh, there was all kinds of temporary exhibits in the Capitol, you would see art, big paintings sort of temporarily shown. And I think that's what this is. This may be some kind of temporary exhibit. This might be uh, portraits of speakers of the house. Uh, there's one. And the, pic the first picture I showed you this, this is somewhere in the rotunda. You can actually see Columbus uh, there in the background. And I think those are the main ones. 
That's great. So, but That's you actually great. see this one, it's labeled in the rotunda and there's a guide there with a kind of this funny look on his face. Uh -huh. Now, we have a, a question from one of our distinguished scholars, Jean Bordewick, who's uh, mm -hmm. been on the Historical Society board during her time. Um, and she asks, what is the most popular art for tourists in the 1860s and early 70s? What, what did the tourists want to see? Good question. You know, most of the, the writing that they had, they sort of talk about the whole, really. Mm -hmm. If there's one specific thing that they mention, it's, uh, they say a lot about the Trumbull paintings, uh, because, I mean, these are images that people were familiar with. They had never even seen the real thing, probably, more than likely, but they'd seen uh, lithographs, engravings, right? And even the, in the 1876 centennial, the um, declaration of, Trumbull's Declaration of Independence was used all over the place, right? It was one of those important symbols. So people said a lot about that. They said a lot about the new expansion spaces, in particular, the, uh, the, the grand staircases. If you've seen those sort of beautiful model sort of marble stairs, that, especially that brown and white, that I, that's right, the house side, right? That brown and white uh, Tennessee marble you see, they said a lot about that uh, as well. But you also, you started to see the Statuary Hall collection begin to come to fruition. Um, so the statue of Washington, they remarked about, by this point, the busts of Kosciuszko and Pulaski are part of this collection as well. Um, surprisingly, a lot to say about them. Those are the biggest ones. And can you tell us where did the term sharpers come from? What? what? <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, and, and I don't have an answer for you. Um, I think it's one of these terms from the time that just meant kind of a crook, right? A con man. And one of the questions uh, is what did people do for food? Uh, you know, was there, were there food service in these, oh. in this time? What, how did people deal At with restroom facilities before sewage and how did all yeah. that work? Sure. Yes and no. Um, in terms of the food, uh, so the, the restaurants were there, but that was the kind of thing that I, anyone could go to, but it especially became a place that guides would take visitors to. If there was time, if they're building a report, guides are working for tips at this point. So anything they could do to, to get on a visitor's good side, they're going to do. Um, and so, yeah, there was a restaurant. However, I mentioned the, the 1828 rules that prohibited African-Americans from the building. Another one of those rules, no food. And no outside food or beverage, which is still a rule, by the way. Uh, that's just, it was just to keep the place clean. That said, there were still, these rules were easy to get around. Um, locals would set up stalls uh, in various places, sell apples, Fruits. Statuary Hall was famously kind of in between the time it was the house and National Statuary Hall. It was kind of this free for all space. People would sell sell food. Um, sometimes even in the rotunda, there would be stalls for this kind of thing. There was even, I, I kid you not, a stall way up in the apotheosis level of the dome that a woman ran for decades. Um, and they could get little snacks and stuff there. Interesting. We also um, have. What we love about our audience is that they always add value to the conversation. And so- uh, What did I get wrong? No, no, not, not wrong. Barbara Willannon, um, who is one of our council scholars said, you know, Barbara- I'm well aware, I've read her works many times. Um, she, she reminded us that the speaker's lobby used to have drawings and prints of the speakers before the portraits began to be done in oil after 1911. So when you were trying to figure out what were those smaller pictures, that that may be very well what that, that was. That is a good point. Let's go back to it. Yeah, I think that that absolutely. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I'm thinking about. Whoop. Yeah. See, aren't you? Glad by the way, in the speakers' lobby too. Uh, later in the decade, later in the century, guidebooks would be for sale there, uh, and guides would actually get a cut from the authors uh, for all the guidebooks they sold. Which would be another thing that would lead to reforms down the line. Um, story and, for another time. Now, at one time in recent history, city guides had to take a test and be licensed. Um, can you tell us about the licensing and the testing? How does all that? You know, I, I got to be honest with you. There's probably someone in the audience who would know more, a little bit more about this than me. Um, the 1880 
sort of city uh, restrictions that were put in place. I don't know if there was a test involved. It really, I think, was more by reputation and who was familiar to Metropolitan Police. Uh, later on, you know, I, I mentioned there, there was an article written somewhere, I'm going to say maybe 20, 30 years ago. It was kind of about this. It was just about how the city was going back and forth between you know, licensing guides or making it a free-for-all. And it, it speaks to, I think, these same questions. It's like, you know, why do this? Shouldn't this be available to everyone? Which of this then, of course, brings up the questions about security and safety, right? And just the value of the information given. There's always kind of that tension there, isn't there? Um, but as far as the, those regulations in the 20th century, I don't have a lot to tell you. I'm sure someone in the audience might know more, actually. Well, we invite you in our audience to give us the, give us the information. Um, do you know um, in what time frame did teachers begin to conduct classes in the Capitol? So glad you asked, because there was a photo I wanted to put in this presentation, but I couldn't really find a place for it. You know, these, these beautiful pictures of, they were, they're dated to 1890, and the dress really looks that way, but it shows a class of young kids, boys and girls, with a teacher at the Columbus doors, at the Grand Staircase, at various points in the building with pieces of paper in their hand. And the late 80s going into the 90s is when really tourism in general starts to look like it we would recognize it today. Um, the family vacation would come into vogue at that time and the school field trip. Uh, I think the earliest account I've seen of that was like the late 80s. Uh, schools from New York would come and, and, and conduct classes there. And when it wasn't the schools, it was teachers, statewide teacher organizations. Uh, would come to the Capitol and get guided tours and they would meet members. And, and these are traditions that are still continue to this day. In fact, I mean, I've seen over Twitter members, you know, there's a school group on a bus outside the building. They can't get in, but a member goes on the bus, you know, and talks to them or whatever. That, that's still part of it. That's, yeah, absolutely. So from this era is when it really starts. And when, when Congress was in session, uh, did the Capitol guides of this era take uh, visitors into the galleries? Yes, absolutely. Again, I mean, they didn't always do it, but again, if this is what your visitors ask for and you're getting money from them, you, you better do it, right? Uh, in fact, I'll share with you a story. And this, is, this happened in, shortly after the First World War. In the 1920s, there was a member of Congress, one in particular, who started to make noise about, hey, the way we're doing tours, it feels wrong. We shouldn't be you know, we shouldn't be excluding people. We shouldn't be making them charge. We need to be, we need to make guides part of the civil service. And many members of Congress looked at this member and thought, what are you talking about, man? Like, this is nothing, whatever. We like these guys, they're fine. It's fine, whatever. And there was a single member who said, I look in the galleries today and I see a group of war, that wounded war veterans with one of these quote, awful capital guides, um, which is poor guy. I mean, it must've been mortifying. I would be mortified. But yeah, to answer your question, yeah, absolutely they did. And they would even they would even whisper to them, that's so and so from so and so. And right, the juicier information you gave, the more likely you are to get a tip. It was it was a different scene at the time than today for sure. And so Blake, from your experience as a tour guide, uh, and now a scholar of guide, you know, activities, uh, what recommendations would you make? for someone to prepare themselves to go on a tour once the Capitol reopens? Talk about for the visitor or from like a guy? For the visitor, for the visitor. What to prepare them? Well, that's a good question. And it's one I've not asked myself and I'm glad you did. And I want to have an answer for you. I think um, come with an open mind, come with an open mind, come with an open heart. Um, and respect, respect the space, respect your fellow visitors respect yourself, right? And respect capital staff. We've all been through a hell of a whole lot. I think everyone on this call knows that. Um, simple things, um, go to your, go to the, the Historical Society website, go to the CBC website if you're looking for maybe some information. The architect of the capital, aoc.gov, they have a great website too, um, if you're looking for more kind of concrete information. Great, well, Blake, you have fascinating information. You present it really well. Um, the PowerPoint's phenomenal, um, and thank so you. thank you very much. We look forward to the Dome article that you're going to write. Uh, so stay tuned, folks, uh, for the next uh, next next installment of Blake Lindsay's wisdom. Um, and as we move forward, 
of course, one of the questions that several people ask, when do we get to go back into the Capitol? Um, I don't know. We wish we knew. Um, <laughs> we wish we knew that will ultimately be a call by the leadership of the House and the Senate and the Capitol Police. And uh, we can tell you that the Historical Society is tracking these information very carefully. And as soon as we know, we will share it with our members, friends, and guests. Um, and we thank you all for participating today. We invite you to our upcoming events. Um, this Thursday, not but two days ago, away, we're going to have a very special uh, webinar about public memory and how we remember the enslaved people who built the Capitol. Um, and we will be featuring uh, former Senator Blanche Lincoln, who was the lead Senate sponsor of the bill to create a memorial in the Capitol Visitor Center uh, to acknowledge the enslaved people who helped to build the Capitol. And Dr. Felicia Bell, now of the Smithsonian, previously of the United States Capitol Historical Society, who did groundbreaking research on the use of enslaved labor in building the Capitol. So come join us in, in two days and, and learn about the role that enslaved people uh, played in building this important facility, our temple of democracy. And on a lighter note, if you have uh, elementary school students and teachers, um, we have our first version of Capital Kids, uh, where Kitty Feldy will be talking about her children's book on State of the Union, uh, Monday, February 28th at noon. And this is an opportunity for classrooms to join in the webinar and the questions will be from students. Uh, so those of you who are adults are welcome to listen but the questions we're gonna take are gonna be from the students. And so I'll be, I'll be fielding those questions. And we're coming to an important event, the State of the Union. Uh, State of the Union comes up uh, one week from today. And so we thought the best thing for us to do to help people understand the State of the Union is to bring two former speech writers who worked on writing the State of the Union, uh, Michael Waldman, who worked with Bill Clinton, and John McConnell, who worked with George W. Bush. And the interesting thing that we wanna highlight is that the State of the Union is presented at the Capitol, presented to the Congress. The State of the Union is not given from the White House. It is in fact the Capitol, which is the place where the president speaks to the country, engaging the Congress. So that should be a fascinating conversation. Come join us at noon on State of the Union Day and get the perspective of folks who have done it in the past. Um, we thank you again. And we also always have to remind you that these programs are available because of the support of our members and guests. So if you're not a member of the Capitol Historical Society, please join. Um, if you haven't given us a gift lately, we would love for you to make a donation. A recurring donation would be even better, um, but we look forward to these programs and please do share them with your friends. They are always available, always free and open to the public, always um, recorded and available later on our website. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, Blake Lindsay. We are honored that you are our Capitol Fellow and that you made today's presentation. Be well. Thank you.